Welcome to Capital Link's company presentation series. Good day to everyone. I am Nicolas Bornelius president of Capital Link, and I would like to welcome you to Capital Link's 2024 corporate presentation series. In this series, company management highlights the company's current operations, business development, growth prospects, and sector outlook. We have with us today the senior management team of Global Cyclis. We have Mr. Thomas Lister, Chief Commercial Officer and Head of ESG. And by the way, as announced, uh, Tom, uh, Thomas will be the CEO of the company as of the end of March of this year. Uh, and we also have with us Mr. Tassos Saropoulos, the Chief Financial Officer. Global Cyclis is the leading independent owner of container ships, with a diversified fleet of mid-size and smaller container ships. As of uh, September 30, 2023, Global Ship Lease owned 68 container ships and uh, the company is listed on the New York Stock Exchange under the Tinker symbol GSL. In terms of logistics, we will begin with the company presentation followed by Q&A. Please note that participants can submit your questions at any point of time during the uh, presentation uh, through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, or email your questions to us at the webinars at capitalink.com, and uh, Thomas and the Tassos will reply to those uh, after their presentation. Before we uh, begin our webinar, kindly note um, the standard disclaimer that uh, this discussion and presentation are only for uh, informational and educational purposes and should not be relied upon. This presentation does not constitute an offer to buy or sell securities or investment advice or advice of any kind, and Capital Link bears no responsibility for its content. And let us now begin our presentation. I will turn the floor over to Thomas and uh, Tassos, and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Nicholas, for the introduction and for hosting us here today, and good morning, afternoon, or evening to all of you listening in. Um, we will be using our 3Q presentation as a base today, but we'll focus on corporate strategy and the market, just as Nicholas indicated. Um, a couple of housekeeping items before we get underway. Uh, as always, the disclaimer and safe harbor slides remind you that today's call may include forward-looking statements that are based on current expectations and assumptions and are by their nature inherently uncertain and outside of the company's control. Actual results may differ materially from these forward-looking statements due to many factors, including those described in the safe heart of a section of the slide presentation. I would also direct you to our most recent annual report and most recent earnings release, both available through our website for a list of relevant risk factors and any reconciliations of non-GAAP figures that we may cite today. For today's event, we'll first give you an overview of GSL and the current state of the market. And then, as Nicholas said, we will be very happy to take your questions at the end. With that, uh, please turn to slide four. Paul, thank you very much. Slide four, please. Uh, slide four is up. Okay, it's up. Great. Sorry, it seems the connection's a little slow on my on my side. Okay, first and foremost, um, as Nicholas said at the outset, Global Ship Lease is an owner and operator, a lessor effectively, of mid-sized and smaller container ships. We lease those ships out to leading container shipping lines, in other words, to the logistics companies who actually carry the containers, such as Maersk, CMA, MSC, Hapag Lloyd, and others typically on a medium to long-term basis under industry standard fixed rate time charter contracts. These contracts are take or pay, providing both insulation from the volatility of the freight and charter markets and good forward visibility on cash flows. And while we manage the operation of the ships, our customers determine where those ships trade and also pay for the fuel. So we're insulated from fuel price volatility as well. Our business model is conservative and risk averse. We allocate capital on the basis of relative returns adjusted for risk and with a focus on generating long-term value for shareholders through the cycle. That means being resilient enough to weather the ups and the downs of the cycle and having the optionality 
combined with the discipline to pounce on the right opportunities when they arise, which is often during the down cycle. I won't dwell on our third quarter and nine month results for 2023, but you can see them summarized here on the right side of the slide. Broadly, strong revenues, an EBITDA margin in the high 60s, and robust earnings per share, allowing us to pay an annualized dividend of $1.50 per common share, which is a dividend yield of over 7%. Uh, and we'll be putting out our 2023 fourth quarter and full year results in early March, just as a, as a guide. So container shipping itself is the conveyor belt of trade. It's cyclical, it's seasonal, and it's subject both to macroeconomic currents and to geopolitical events. Paradoxically, sand in the gears of the supply chain tends to be supportive of industry earnings as inefficiencies in the system suck up effective supply, which in turn tightens the supply demand balance, which also in turn supports pricing. Tragic and ghastly as the root causes undoubtedly are, disruptions to navigation in the and through sewers are very firmly in this category. In fact, industry analysts, analysts calculate that, all else equal, diverting all sewers transits around the Cape of Good Hope would reduce effective capacity of the global container ship fleet by about 8%, so it's meaningful. The challenges currently posed by low water levels in the Panama Canal also reduce efficiency and suck up effective supply, but the effect is much more marginal than that of sewers. Now, these are both complex topics, uh, which we will be happy to cover in more detail in the Q&A, as we realize they're very much at the front of people's minds. But we're already seeing charter market rates and durations beginning to firm as a result uh, of both of these issues. The uptick isn't huge, but it is directionally helpful, especially at a time when charter market rates and asset values had previously been under downward pressure. Let's turn now, please, to slide five. And this provides a very quick overview of our charter portfolio. Most of the liner companies are represented here, by which I mean the top liner companies, top tier liner companies are represented here. And we have about 1.8 billion of contracted revenues over a weighted average duration of 2.1 years, uh, as at the end of the third quarter. We can continue to add to those contracted revenues um, over the course of 2023, uh, with an additional 225 million of additional revenues agreed through the first nine months of the year. Slide six, if we could turn to that now, provides an illustrative overview of our future earnings potential under different rate scenarios. And I should emphasize that these figures are not forecasts, but you can see that revenues for 2023 were pretty much fully contracted by the end of the third quarter, with over 80% already contracted for 2024 too. So this is entirely consistent with our prudent and conservative business model and focus upon um, forward visibility on cash flows. Moving on to slide seven, I'll quickly recap our capital allocation strategy and capital allocation is obviously the name of the game. And we keep this under constant review to adjust for changing risks and opportunities. We maintain our sustainable, and I emphasize sustainable quarterly dividend, which totals $1.50 per share on an annualized basis. And we have a track record of opportunistic share buybacks. From late 2021, in fact, until the time of our third quarter results, um, we purchased $52 million worth of our shares in the open market, meaning that our share count is about 8% lower than it would otherwise have been. An additional 38 million of capacity remains under our opportunistic buyback authorization. We also continue to build equity value and de-risk by significantly delevering our balance sheet, which we believe is prudent in any scenario and is particularly so in one marked by macroeconomic and geopolitical uncertainty such as that which we face today. With evolving regulatory and commercial pressures to decarbonize, we've seen good opportunities to invest in our fleet to improve performance, reduce emissions, and add commercial value to our ships. We also believe that it is important to maintain cash liquidity for both resilience and for optionality, particularly as attractive acquisition opportunities tend to arise during the industry downcycle. Overall, we intend to remain patient, nimble, 
and focused on long-term shareholder value. Let's turn now to slide eight, please. And here we illustrate something that I mentioned earlier, but which I think justifies dwelling on for a moment. Um, GSL has demonstrated that we have a platform that allows us to execute upon value accretive growth when conditions are right, as evidenced by our doubling in size in the Poseidon transaction in 2018, and the very significant growth in the fleet and our earnings in the years thereafter. But what this chart also underlines is that we are highly disciplined and avoid chasing asset prices up. You can see in the orange section of the chart a period of time when the price of container ships went through the roof. And you can see that GSL did not purchase a single vessel during that time. Instead, we returned capital to shareholders by buying back shares. The recent normalization in asset prices and scope for attractive returns at acceptable risks brought us back into the market in May 2023, when we purchased four 8,500 TEU ships in a deal combining the trifecta of strong contracted revenues right out of the gate, minimal downside risk, and significant upside earnings potential. And we would expect over time for, the, for there to be more such opportunities. Now I'll pass the call to Tassos to briefly discuss our financials. Thank you, Tom. Slide nine is the usual snaps note of our finances. Again, as of the third quarter, I won't go over every point here, but a few important takeaways. Our earnings and cash flow continue to grow versus the prior year. Our gross debt has continued to reduce even after we purchased and partially financed four ships in mid-2023. Our cash position is strong. I would point out that more than half of that position consists of restricted cash, the majority of which is advanced receipt of charter hire. That being said, the remainder covers our liquidity covenants and working capital needs, while also providing some optionality to move quickly on opportunities that might present themselves. We have capped our interest rate exposure and actually have additional headroom under our 64 base points so for caps, should we have the opportunity to, to utilize it. Tom has already touched on our quarterly dividend, which is sized to be sustainable through the ups and downs of the cycle and our opportunistic share buybacks. Finally, our credit ratings from the various rating agencies are strong and materially improving in recent years, as we have strengthened our balance sheet and demonstrated a strong track record of managing our business prudently through the cycle. Notably, our outstanding senior secured notes due 2027 have been rated investment grade. Flight 10 now provides insight into our delivering efforts and our reduced cost of debt over time. Key takeaways here are the significant extent of our deleveraging, which put us on pace to reduce our debt outstanding by a third from the end of 2022 to the end of 2024. We have brought our cost of debt significantly to 450 base points, even as prevailing interest rates increased. And on the right side, you can see the evolution of our financial leverage over time, with our adjusted net debt to adjusted EBITDA going from 8.4 times to 1.7 times over the last several years. This is a dramatic change that has fundamentally transformed GSL's risk profile. With that, I will turn it back to Tom to discuss our market focus and SIP deployment. Thank you, Tassos. Uh, moving on to slide 11 now, um, we explain here our focus on high specification, mid-size and smaller container ships, ranging from roughly 2,000 TU at the bottom end to around 10,000 TU at the top end. The top map on this slide uh, illustrates the deployment of ships within our preferred size range, highlighting their operational flexibility which is a very good structural hedge in uncertain times, such as these, and their widespread reach. In contrast, the lower map shows the deployment of larger ships at 10,000 TU and higher, which tend to be more constrained to the main east-west arterial trade routes with suitable deep water port infrastructure. And I would say that you know these, these map, uh, maps capture uh, quote unquote, the normal deployment of ships. Uh, clearly, there has been a very significant shift 
in deployment of ships of all sizes that previously were passing through you know, the Red Sea and Suez area and are now being diverted um, in large part around the Cape of Good Hope, the southern tip of Africa. So you know, keep this as a, a snapshot in time uh, that was representative of normality, but is not representative of how things stand today. And I'm sure we'll come back to that in the, uh, in the Q&A. Slide 12 represents a view of idle capacity and ship recycling. Idle capacity bottomed out at just under 0.9% during the third quarter. Uh, and from that effectively full utilization, we saw a slight increase in idle capacity to 1.1% at the quarter's end. And this upward trend continued into the fourth quarter, which has begun to tighten again as a result of Suez. Logically, the uptick in idle vessels was accompanied by the return of scrapping activity for essentially the first time since 2020, albeit at a limited scale thus far. The record-breaking charter markets of 2021 and 2022 saw the lives of many older and lower specification container ships extended and scrapping pushed back, in other words, due to their phenomenal earnings at that time. However, as the market normalized, normalizes, and this normalization has been deferred a bit by the situation in the Red Sea and Suez, there is an expectation that there will be a catch up in scrapping. Regulatory dry dockings, which ships are obliged to go through typically on a five year cycle, prompt owners to consider whether investing a couple of million dollars is justified by the forward earnings potential of a ship. So when a vessel is aging, poorly specified, or both, the answer may well be no particularly if there is a challenging outlook ahead and the ship likely gets scrapped. And we'll come back to that uh, on, on what it may mean in a moment. On slide 13, we show the order book, which is heavily weighted towards the larger ship sizes. In other words, the over 10,000 TU segments in which, to be clear, GSL does not participate. With an order book to fleet ratio of 14.5%, the order book to, for, for mid-size and smaller container ships, which are the segments relevant to GSL, is much smaller, but still meaningful. Here, the older age profile of the mid-sized and smaller fleet peer group is important context and ties in with what I was saying earlier about deferred scrapping and the scrap versus, in, uh, the, the quote unquote, scrap versus invest decisions that may be driven by regulatory dry dockings. Extrapolating this point, if we were to assume the scrapping of all ships over 25 years old and net those numbers out against the, the order book for mid-size and smaller ships delivering through 2027, our focus segments would see net growth of only 1.2% through 2027. Probably an extreme scenario, admittedly, but illustrative of the supply side safety valve for the industry in the event of a protracted downturn. Slide 14 looks at the charter market, which, together with asset values, has been normalizing after the extreme highs of 2021 and 2022. We provide some indicative rates on the right-hand side of the slide. These, of course, reflect our best assessment of where things stood at the end of Q3, after which rates softened further in Q4. However, when Suez and Red Sea transits began to be disrupted um, in the holiday period, Demand for capacity went up, the supply demand balance tightened, and as a result, both charter rates and contract durations began to firm. So the market may, may now even be a little higher than some of the rates shown here, um, but how long this will last is, of course, anybody's guess. Turning to slide 15, I will very quickly summarize to ensure that we have sufficient time to take your questions. Point one, we've continued to grow our earnings in EBITDA and have good forward contract cover to support debt service, CapEx, and our sustainable dividend. Point two, our balance sheet is in good shape with conservative financial leverage, ongoing amortization, and very competitively priced debt, thanks to the interest rate caps we put in place a couple of years back, with coverage through uh, to the end of 2026. Point three, macro uncertainty continues to exert downward pressure on market sentiment. Um, although the current Suez and Red Sea situation has reduced and for a time has even reversed downward pressure on freight rates. 
It'll be very interesting to see how this impacts forward guidance from the liner operators themselves, which had previously been cautious to bearish in tone, albeit from a position of significantly fortified balance sheets. And finally, point four, we will continue to be tightly focused on allocating capital in such a way as to maximize our resilience and to continue to generate long-term value for shareholders, including delevering, paying a sustainable dividend, buying back shares opportunistically. And I will conclude our prepared remarks by emphasizing that container shipping is a cyclical industry that tends to reward those who have strong balance sheets and access to capital when others do not. And we aim to keep GSL in a position of strength to capitalize on opportunities that may arise during the down cycle, which is when the potential to build long-term value tends to be the most compelling. So with that, uh, we would be very pleased to take your questions, uh, which I think should be channeled via Nicholas. Thomas and Tassos, thank you very much for uh, this uh, introductory presentation. Uh, let me, you have quite a few questions, obviously, that have come through. Let me start uh, uh, fielding them to you. The first one is, obviously, everybody's concerned with what is happening right now in the Red Sea and Suez. So can you talk a little bit more about how you see the current situation in, in the Red Sea? Yes. Um... Suez impacting the container shipping industry? Sure. Um, I mean, as I said in the prepared remarks, um, the the underlying roots of, of what's going on in, in Suez and the Red Sea are obviously awful and, and tragic in nature. So what I will limit myself to um, is providing some additional statistics, which will pay, help, uh, I hope, people understand um, you know, what's going on. So to set the table, um, Roughly 20% of containerized shipping volumes actually, under normal circumstances, flow through um, sewers. But that actually understates the, the situation because these are primarily container volumes on long-haul trades. And to support long-haul trades, you actually need greater capacity than the volumes would actually suggest. So the 20% of container volumes are actually carried on between 30 and 35% of global capacity through sewers. So if you suddenly shut off that channel uh, and preclude 30 to 35% of global capacity from going through it, and instead um, redirect all of that capacity around the southern tip of Africa, the Cape of Good Hope, um, which adds, I mean, this varies a little bit, but, but crudely, which, which may add roughly 30%, to transit times, you can imagine that there's potentially a very significant impact, not only to liner companies' networks, but also for their need for additional capacity. Because if you've got a, a more inefficient system, which obviously you have, if you're adding 30% to, uh, to transit times and distances, in order to maintain the same service frequency, you need to add additional capacity. So, I mean, estimates vary on this, but those that I've read um, suggest that if most, if not all, of containerized uh, capacity were redirected from Suez around the Cape of Good Hope, it would be the same as taking roughly 8% of effective capacity out of the system. Now, that immediately tightens the supply-demand balance, and predictably enough, you start seeing um, spot rates climb, uh, for the liner operators themselves. So they're seeing uh, uh, um, freight rates go up. And slightly more slowly, you also start to see um, charter rates and importantly, charter durations, which were you know both under pressure towards the end of the fourth quarter of last year, climb again. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Um, I don't know what else I can, I can add to that. I know I mentioned in the prepared remarks, Panama, um, I mean, that, that's much more marginal in terms of impact than, uh, than Suez. Um, to give you a sort of a sense of size, I would say probably roughly 5% of global trade typically flows through Panama. And what we're seeing is not a shutting off of trade through Panama, but a constraining of trade through Panama. So the effect there is directionally the same, but is, is much more marginal in, in nature. 
Well, shipping to a large extent is an event-driven business, and apparently we have a number of events now taking place all over the world. Um, question number two, uh, you mentioned an interest rate cap. Can you please provide more details? And specifically, what did you mean by headroom under the cap? Got it. That's probably more a question for Tassos. Sure. Uh, we have actually put in place uh, before uh, March 2022 when the rate heights to uh, initiated uh, an interest rate cap, which was about 1 billion uh, and uh, with a plan of anticipated debt amortization throughout the time. Uh, this was based on 75 base points LIBOR, uh, which have converted to 64 base points SOFR uh, on the transition last June, uh, give us a very, very cheap cost of debt. Now, regarding the headroom, it's more related to the fact that we have done in uh, May, uh, two years before, a very big refinance um, with uh, the private placement notes uh, that's going to be expired in 2027. Uh, so we have offloaded uh, a number of these interest rate cap in order for us to be able to use it in uh, in future investments uh, by using a very cheap cost of debt for us in uh, in new investments. Thank you. Uh, ju just just to add to that, sure. um, if if I may. Tassel. So the US private placement that we, we placed, as Tassel said, in May 2022, it was 350 million, and it was um, rated as investment grade paper. So that was, you know, a, a, a very positive event for us. And, and as Tassel says, it opens up quite a lot of headroom under the cap, which allows us to supercharge the returns, the levered returns on any acquisitions that we make. So I mentioned in the in the prepared remarks that we had bought four eight and a half thousand TU ships back in May of 2023 um, with charters attached and we were able to make use um, of the, the 64 basis points sofa cap um, for the debt that was used to partly fund those ships to supercharge the returns now it doesn't mean that we you know we we lower um, our investment hurdles because we have access to cheaply priced debt but it does mean that when we make acquisitions in line with our, you know, our investment criteria, the levered returns are supercharged by the fact that we can make use of the, uh, the headroom under the cap. Thank you. Now, going to the next question, uh, you've alluded to that uh, already in your pre prepared remarks and also with your uh, question now, the, with your answer. What did you see in terms of growth opportunities? Uh, um, good question. I mean, we, we, we see growth opportunities um, all the way through the cycle. Um, we, we always apply the same sort of discipline and investment criteria to them. Um, and as a result, you know, we haven't made any transactions since the, the acquisition that we made in May of last year. But I would say that the sort of transactions that uh, we would move on would be very much in line with that transaction, which, as I say, or as I said in the prepared remarks, I think combines the uh, the magic ingredients of immediate forward visibility on cash flows right out of the gate, good downside uh, protection, um, you know, uh, the the scrap value on the vessels in combination with the contracted cash flows already meant that we covered off our risk uh, for the transaction, and they need to be ships that have, in our view, strong forward earnings potential. So. That's what we're looking for, and we're looking for, uh, you know, levered returns. Um, obviously, everyone will run their own sensitivity analysis, but we're looking for uh, levered returns in the in the high teens and low twenties. So it's opportunities of that nature um, that we're interested in. And as the cycle turns, um, and this is being deferred, you know, the normalization of the cycle or the, the normalization of asset values is being pushed back a little bit by what's happening in, in Suez and, and the Red Sea, because that's increasing earnings in the market, which as a result feeds through to um, a reversal, at least of the downward um, movement of, of asset values. But we tend to see greater opportunities, more compelling opportunities during the down cycle. And, you know, whether we're, we're at the beginning of that now, 
uh, remains to be seen. But we want to be in a position to jump on the opportunities when they arise. And as Tassel says, uh, we, we have the tools to do so. Sorry, just to add on that is that on page eight that we have already uh, mentioned, it's very clear how disciplined we are following this strategy in the same pattern. Uh, on the timing of the events that we have made the acquisitions we have made the last two and a half years. Thank you. Now, the next question that uh, came through, uh, what do you expect uh, to happen on the scrapping front? Scrapping. Um, okay, so it, scrapping of, of capacity uh, tends to take place um, as, as I mentioned in the um, in the prepared remarks, when there's a sort of a moment of clarity for for owners, so ships have to go through um, special surveys, typically on you know a five year cycle. This is something they're obliged to go through uh, in order to continue trading, and typically you would expect to have to spend a couple of million on on a ship to get her through a special survey. So um, owners will effectively perform an investment analysis when deciding whether or not to invest that additional 2 million US um, in keeping the ship running and their view on whether or not they're going to generate a return on that invested capex is obviously going to be driven by their view on forward earnings on the asset. So, um, so far, the option value of the assets and the earnings environment has meant that people have continued to invest in dry, dock dry dockings and as a result defer scrapping. Um, so we saw zero scrapping in 2021 and, and 2022 effectively when earnings were through the roof and anything that floated um, was able to generate cash flows. We saw a modest uptick last year. It was roughly 100,000 TU that was scrapped through the first nine months and probably let's say another 40 or 50,000 um, in the in the final quarter, scrapping at the moment is very modest because people are waiting to see um, how sustainable the earnings uptick is going to be as a result of of sewers. But um, I still think that when the market eventually normalizes again, um, we will see a scrapping catch up, particularly of of lower specification tonnage, which um, saw its life extended as a result of, you know, the the, the astronomically attractive uh, earnings in the market over the last three years or so. Well, we have another question that came uh, through that to some extent relates to this. Uh, you mentioned decarbonization regulations. Uh, what are these and what do they mean for the industry? I guess scrapping is related to these regulations. Uh, so what do these regulations mean for the industry? and for GSL in particular? Sure. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's rather, a, on the face of it, it's a simple question, but but it's it's quite a complex question in that there's a, a wide range of, of regulations that are being brought in, uh, both by the International Maritime Organization, which is the, or the IMO, which is the global regulator for the shipping industry, uh, but also by um, national and regional governments, you know, such as the European Union. Um, so there's a whole host of, of regulations, probably the most relevant uh, in terms of triggering a change of behavior to reduce the carbon footprint of the industry is the EU ETS. So that's uh, the incorporation of shipping within the EU emission trading scheme. Uh, which began on the 1st of January of, of this year. And now it means that if, if ships are trading uh, within or to and from Europe, um, emissions that they produce while doing so will be subject to the requirement to purchase um, EU allowances. So for every tonne of carbon dioxide that your ship emits, in the uh, in the jurisdiction of um, EU ETS, you will be obliged to provide to, to purchase one um, uh, EUA one one allowance. Now, this is a cap and trade scheme, so these allowances are traded uh, in the open market. Uh, I think the current price of each allowance is roughly sixty five to seventy euros. Um, so, for every ton of, of carbon dioxide you produce, that's uh, you're, you're pinged. For, um, for 65 to 70 euros. Now, when I say you are pinged, I should be more specific. This is something for which the charterers, our customers, 
will ultimately have to pay. And given it's the charterers, our customers who control where the ships are deployed and pay for the fuel, it's only logical that they do so. But what it means is that if you emit more, it's now costing you, it's expensive. You're not only burning fuel, but you're also having to buy these allowances. So then how does the industry react? Well, there are various ways in which it can react. The first um, is to effectively slow ships down. If you want to emit less, given that the relationship between fuel consumption and emissions is logarithmic, you slow ships down a little bit, you reduce emissions a lot. So that's the first thing that shipping lines can do, slow down. Now that's helpful to supply demand balance because if you slow ships down, it's again, the same as taking out effective supply. You reduce the speed of the global fleet by one knot, then you actually uh, are effectively taking out roughly 6% of effective capacity, which is helpful. So that's an immediate reaction, slowing down the fleet um, we're, that we're beginning to see. Then um, charterers uh, with, in cooperation with owners such as us uh, can invest in um, improving the efficiency of ships by investing in making them move you know, more frictionlessly through the water effectively. Uh, and then you can also apply uh, data, uh, high frequency data to ships to ensure that they are operated uh, more efficiently, but everything is focused upon reducing emission. The much longer term, there's obviously a transition to um, you know, lower uh, footprint fuels, but you know, there's a whole wide palette of potential fuels are out there and no one is yet clear which is likely to be you know, the winning fuel of the future. So we at least, are deferring judgment on that, doing what we can to save fuel now and waiting to see what will happen on the in the future. But overall, decarbonization is a good thing, both um, ecologically and also economically uh, for tonnage providers such as us. Um, Thomas, a number, you have already uh, touched upon this topic, but a number of questions that have come through refer to if you have any plans, any scrapping plans for your older ships in the fleet? For our ships? Um, I would say no. Um, we have, uh, it's true, older ships within our fleet. But when you look at a ship and determine whether or not it's a good ship or a bad ship, age is only a very, very crude and imperfect proxy. What you really need to do is look at the, um, the specification of that ship. So you can have a relatively older ship, which is very highly specified. And one, one example, if a ship is able to um, carry a high volume of refrigerated cargo, because it has the onboard power capacity to supply the refrigerated containers loaded by uh, the container shipping lines, then that is a high specification ship, which is extremely attractive commercially. Now, whether it's 10 years old or 15 year olds or, or five year, years old doesn't really make a huge difference. So that's one thing. You have to look at the specification of the ship. And then you also have to look at the peer group uh, against which that ship is competing. And because there's been um, very little investment focused upon new buildings, in mid-size and smaller ships, that means that the peer groups of mid-size and smaller ships are much older structurally than for the larger ships. So sub 10,000 TU ships, the ships against which our fleet is competing are older ships, whereas the over 10,000 TU ships, the bigger ships are younger ships. So if we have a high specified ship, and all of the ships in our fleet are highly specified. And if they're competing against vessels of the same age, but potentially of lower specification, then they are not necessarily scrapping candidates. Clearly, we will run the investment analysis I referred to earlier, which is if a ship is approaching its five-year special survey, does the forward earnings potential of that ship justify the invested capex to bring it through the special survey? If it doesn't, then we will look at selling or recycling the ship. But if it does, we'll take the vessel through. And so far, the earnings in the market um, uh, are supportive and a huge proportion of our fleet is contracted anyway. So um, we would be looking to take the ships through their special surveys. One of the questions that has come through also refers to how does the current backlog 
backlog of sleep orders impact business. You refer to the backlog of uh, new buildings by category. So maybe you want to touch upon that again, but by sleep type, I mean. Sure. So, and and we we had a slide on this in the deck, which people can take a look at perhaps on our on our website when they have time. But you have to look at the order book um, uh, on a on a sort of granular basis. You can't look at it on a just a homogenous basis, because as soon as you start to break it down, you'll see that the order book is disproportionately weighted to the big ships. It's disproportionately weighted to ships of 10,000 TU and up. Uh, meantime, if you look at the 10,000 TU uh, and down order book, you're looking at a much more modest order book to fleet ratio. I think it's roughly 14 or 15 percent um, for our vessel sizes. And that's stretched out in terms of deliveries between now and 2027. So when you're looking at a 14% order book to fleet ratio, it's not all delivering tomorrow, it's delivering over the course of the next three to four years, which is phasing um, uh, capacity expansion. And then on the flip side, if we go back to the scrapping point and you run the analysis of figuring out which ships are going to hit their 25 year special survey and face this invest versus divest decision, and you net those ships out against the order book, you get implied growth through the same period of roughly 1.2% or so for the sub 10,000 TU fleet. So there is a significant safety valve. I, I realize I've just laid out an extreme example, but there is a significant safety valve which will allow the industry to downsize um, existing capacity, low specification, older existing capacity as new capacity comes online if there is insufficient demand uh, to do otherwise. Another question that came through is, uh, which is the best way to value global ship lease? Is it uh, NAV basis, charter value, plus scrap, or any other method? Actually, that's a very interesting question applying, obviously, to GSL, but I guess to simply companies overall especially companies with your profile having long-term yeah i mean yeah i mean that, that is a you, you're right it's a very good question it's a very difficult question to answer i would say that nav is not the way to um value container ship leasing companies and the reason i say that is that our whole business is focused upon the forward visibility of cash flows putting in place time charter contracts. Well, at the moment, as, as, as I mentioned in the, in the presentation, we've got about 1.8 billion of forward contracted revenues over a weighted average of 2.1 years. So everything that we do is focused in putting in place mid and longer term contract cover. So it's really um, a valuation I would suggest on the basis of cash flows, um, which is, more realistic. I think NAV, first of all, it's very, very difficult to put a pin in NAV on a charter attached basis. You talk to um, three brokers and you'll get come out with three different NAV uh, calculations. So I think it's much more logical to try to value the business on the basis upon which we're trying to drive the business, which is cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. And on top of that, just to add, is that uh, it's a very uh, it's definitely not an asset play industry, container business, and it's not a liquidity. You don't have uh, regular transactions in order to, to use at least NAV as an indication. Well, look, clearly in your case, cash flow is the right way to go, especially given the contract cover that we have. Uh, however, I have another question that came through. Uh, a number of people are looking at NAV the discount to NAV creates an opportunity for shareholder value. And uh, the question is, how do you, what is your capital allocation strategy in terms of capturing the potential that this discount creates? Well, we, tr we try to be as, as thoughtful and as, as nimble as possible when it comes to, to capital allocation. And we allocate capital on the basis of risk and reward. And the, the, those dynamics will change through the cycle. So if, if we go back to the chart that I showed 
and again, people can look at this online in our, our, our quarterly earnings presentation. There's a chart which shows how asset values and charter rates have varied over the, car, last, uh, the course of the last 20 years or so. And during the 2021 to 2022 period, when asset values were super elevated, we didn't buy a single ship. It didn't make sense to allocate capital to asset acquisitions at that point in the cycle. So instead, we pivoted towards um, the buyback of shares in the market. This is obviously in addition to servicing our sustainable $1.50 annualized dividend. So, you know, we try to be thoughtful, we try to try to be nimble. And um, conversely, as we approach uh, a point in the cycle that is um, certainly um, off the peaks and is normalizing and heading, we would think actually towards the down cycle, then the opportunities to, to buy assets on the basis that we did back in May of 2023 uh, would cause us to pivot towards uh, investing in value accretive acquisitions. I mean, we are a ship owning company, we are a lessor, and we have to replace our fleet. And we have to, I mean, it's a, an expression that our chairman likes to use, if you're going to keep milking the cow, you've got to feed the cow. Uh, and in other words, buy ships. So, you know, we, we will allocate capital, depending upon the context, and we will do it in such a way as to focus upon building value for shareholders through the cycle. Two more questions because we're running out of time. You have a lot of questions that have come through anyways. We'll not be able to touch upon all of them, but uh, one of them regarding growth plans, uh, I mean, you have a large fleet. Uh, is there an optimal size in terms of vessel, uh, in terms of fleet size that uh, you feel comfortable with or you're targeting? No, no, we're, we're, we're not empire builders here. Um, so we grow the fleet when we see the opportunity to add value to the fleet. Um, I mean, there are some economies of scale at the operating level, but I think we're already well into those economies of scale and adding ships are not necessarily going to add economies of scale. However, um, obviously a larger asset base should um, support a larger market capitalization. And a larger market capitalization does get you onto the screens of additional um, investors, and as a result, should form or help create a virtuous cycle um, for, uh, for all investors. So no, we don't have a target fleet size. A last question, but I think an important one that has come through, uh, it focuses on charter behavior. Uh, especially given the volatility in the market, uh, do you see how do you see charters behaving in the current environment? Uh, are you concerned about charters in general? Uh, no, we're not. We're not concerned about charters in general. Um, this is very much a relationship business. So, you know, perhaps um, the easiest analogy to draw is that the, the shipping lines for us are a bit like. Um, the airlines in terms of each having complicated networks to maintain and the maintenance of those networks is going to be crucial to the service quality that they provide to um, to their own customers now if um, if they cannot rely upon the tonnage that is being provided into those networks reckoning you know recognizing that roughly half of all capacity that's deployed by Maersk or MSC or whomsoever, the big liner companies, is drawn in from the charter market, then they're putting their own businesses at risk. So this is a long-term relationship game. Um, we don't have any concerns um, about charterers. Um, all of them are performing as they should. And clearly, it's, it's good news that um, unexpectedly, the freight markets have seen an upswing um, of late. But even if they hadn't, the balance sheets of the liner operators, our counterparties, the charterers, are the strongest they have ever been. So no, I think um, we, we don't lose sleep at night on that front. On this very positive and reassuring note, uh, let me take the opportunity to thank you both for an excellent presentation, for a, a very vivid uh, Q&A. Um, you had great attendance and lots of questions. A number of them still remain unanswered, but I think we have run out of time already. I'd like to thank you both.
I'd like to thank our participants for joining us. And I'd like to remind everybody that this um, uh, webinar will be available for replay upon demand very shortly on the Catalink website, catalinkwebinars.com, and on our YouTube channel. So thank you very much. Thank well, you, thanks. Nicholas. Yeah, thank you to you and to the Capital Link team and to everyone who's been kind enough to dial in today. Uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you.